Hey everybody, John Abdo here, author of Wolves of Crow Time, The Untold Story of Milo, a USA Today bestseller. Reader reviews are absolutely fantastic. I appreciate those of you who've already read it and given your comments. Those of you who haven't read it, listen to some of these videos and you'll be convinced that this is a book you'll want to get. Basically, in these videos, I just try to give some explanations and tell the backstories to the stories, which are really, really interesting. And this particular presentation is inspired by Malcolm Gladwell's David and Goliath. You got this little guy beating a giant. And the bottom line for this particular presentation, how it relates to Milo of Croton, is David beat Goliath when David was in his prime. Goliath was in his prime as well. And I'm going to prove to you in this session that Milo was not in his prime when he met his Goliath, but he beat his Goliath almost or just as easy as David beat his. Now, we know the Philistines were always battling with the Israelites over territory, and the Israelites, which David represented, if we give in to these people, we're going to be their slaves for eternity. So they went on the battlefield, the Philistines and the Israelites, and the Philistines says, if you beat our best warrior, we become your slaves. And all of a sudden, Goliath walks out. I mean, he's chest, shoulders, chin, nose, and head above all the other Philistines. And the Israelites look look up and look up, and they go, holy smoly, we can't beat this guy. How can we beat this guy? And David walks out from the back of the uh, crowd and says, I'll fight him. And say, like, you fight him. David's like this tall. He's a young, vivacious shepherd. He's obviously in shape. He's outdoors all the time. He walks everywhere. He climbs. So shepherds are really in great shape. They're baiting and antagonizing animals to get them stronger. And David, all of a sudden, is faced with this monumental challenge, which he takes upon himself. They didn't recruit David. David volunteered. Goliath comes forward in front of the Philistine phalanx, and he's coated in armor. He's got this big, heavy bronze helmet on because Goliath, they said, was six foot nine to seven feet tall. So his armor must have weighed at least 100 pounds. He had acromeglia, that growth hormone disease where everything, including your chin, your skull, your fingers, everything in your body just grows really big. So Goliath walks forward. He's got this big sword in one hand, a big hoplon shield in the other, this huge, heavy breastplate to protect him from projectiles. And David walks forward, pulls out of his pocket, after everyone's laughing at him, a sling. And the sling is just two ropes connected to a leather pouch and you put a rock in there, you spin it around, the centrifugal force builds up the pre-velocity, he lets it go with accuracy because slingers can kill birds in mid-flight, can kill rabbits in mid-run, and they were used as artillery in support of the archers or bowmen, uh, javelin throwers uh, on the big side, the ballistas and the catapults, but the slingers were the artillerymen. They fought at a distance, and Goliath wasn't expecting a distant challenge. So David beat Goliath by hurling his projectile out of his sling and smashed Goliath. Some said in the eye, some said in the forehead, but the velocity, according to some experts, is equivalent to a fair-sized modern-day handgun. So he got shot right in the head with a big bullet because the rock must have been at least the size of a golf ball, maybe even bigger than that. Only those who have the courage to face the fiercest battles will receive the greatest rewards. Apollo. So how does this relate to Milo of Croton? Never heard of Milo of Croton slinging rocks or fighting other giants. He was challenged once by Tatormus, but that was just a rock lifting competition. And he observed Bybon, the other stone lifter, compete and break an official world record with a single arm press. But what makes this 
a parallel with Milo's defeat of his Goliath was that Milo competed for 28 years in Olympiad competition. He peaked and peaked and peaked from 540 BC, which was the World Youth Games, to 512 BC, which was the 67th Olympiad. So 28 years. Now at the 67th Olympiad, this was Milo's biggest wrestling challenge in his whole entire life. And the same reason David had advantage over Goliath. Milo fought or wrestled Timotheus, a teammate who observed Milo for the last 12 years. Well, the athletes knew, including Timotheus, but I'm going to evade him with the technique called Acrotria Racemos. A lot of videos here, a lot of posts on Acrotria Racemos. So Milo, for the first time, had a wrestling opponent that wouldn't engage him. He didn't have close combat or cystasis position, forehead to forehead, the hand behind the uh, back of the nape or neck, and cupping the uh, tricep. So Matthias didn't do that. And what makes this even more interesting is that some historians say that the boundaries for the wrestling pit weren't like an octagon or a boxing ring or whatever. They wrestled in the whole field. They had the whole field to perform their wrestling craft. Can you imagine someone staying away from you in a football size arena? They wrestled and wrestled until the sun went down. Lysanias. You can imagine Milo being the number one anaerobic athlete in the world, or in history for that matter, didn't have to engage with the starting position with Tamatateus. He had to chase him around. I got to grab this guy. I got to be able to maneuver into his body. And Tamatateus just let Milo run around for literally hours and hours and hours. They said until the sun went down, the historians said they fought and fought and fought until the sun went down. Milo must have been completely exhausted. The officials and the organizing committee of the Olympiad Games says, Enough's enough. They fought for hours. They proved that they're both determined competitors, that no one's going to give in, give them both the victory. It was a draw. By using the technique known as Acrotria Racemos, Timotheus evaded Milo's crushing embrace and was not beaten. Pausanias. So how does that relate to Goliath? Milo is old at the 67th Olympiad Games. He's like 47 years of age. Timotheus wore the hell out of the guy because he's old. It's his last Olympic Games, and he didn't have to run around a football-sized wrestling pit to chase his opponent for hours on end. So Milo was old. He was injured. He was tired. He was burnt out. Milo was burnt out. Although both city-states were founded by Peloponnesians, and positioned less than 25 miles apart, the close proximity of Croton to Sybaris prevented the latter from expanding their borders, creating interminable animosity and conflict. By 510 BC, all of a sudden, the Sybarites, which Sybaris is just 20 miles north of Croton, for the last 200 years, they've been antagonizing Croton, they've been jealous of Croton, all of the favor has gone to Croton, because of Milo, an Olympic champion. Everyone wants to know, what's Croton doing? What's Milo doing? Califan and Democrates, which are the top physicians in the world, it's like, hey, athletes get injured. Kings and queens and archons and aristocrats get injured. Let's go to Croton and go to their infirmary. We can be treated by the greatest physicians and bone setters in the world. And they had the master seer in Pythagoras. Croton was just so popular. More and more and more people went to Croton because of their popularity, made Croton really wealthy, uh, put Sybaris in the back seat, economically speaking. A brief definition of a Sybarite is a person who is self-indulgent in their fondness or lust for sensuous luxury. This includes, but is certainly not limited to, being a hedonist, sensualist, voluptuary, libertine, and, as was repeatedly expressed by the historians, pleasure seekers. Sybaris was hated by people around the world. 
They literally wanted to show off their wealth by making their bodies fatter. I could eat as much food as I can afford, and I can afford a lot of food, and you can't, so the gods favor us over you. Now there arose among the Sybarites a leader of the people named Teles, who brought charges against the most influential men and persuaded the Sybarites to exile the 500 wealthiest citizens and confiscate their estates. By 510 BC, Teles was dead set to start his own games called the Sybarite Games. Screw the Olympiad Games. We can't compete against Milo and the other Cretonians and some of the other Greek athletes. The officials hate us. The spectators hate us. We're going to start the Sybarite Games. Where do you get the money to put that up? 500 of the aristocrats, the wealthiest people in Sybaris, started investing, which they always did. And if they didn't, they would have been murdered or tortured into Telly's crazy diabolical ideas. But then secretly, Telly's was trying to form some war against Croton because Milo was old. The people of Sybaris killed 30 members of a delegation from their neighbors of Croton. They seen Milo huffing and puffing during his battle with Timotheus at the 67th Olympiad. Maybe he had a few grays on his head. Maybe he didn't carry the bull during that competition or carry it as far as he did in previous competitions. Hey, it's time to attack the Cretonians. But the 500 wealthiest citizens that invested in Tellys, the Sybarite Games, Tellys would not give them their money back. Tellys confiscated not just what they invested, he confiscated all their wealth. He froze their treasuries, froze their bonds, seized all their assets, and kicked them out. He says, hey, if you're not going to support me, you get out of Sybaris. I made you rich. This is my money. It's not your money. Get out of here. Go get rich somewhere else. Here's where the battle of Sybaris begins. The 500 Sybarites, where they go? Those of you who read the book know. They went to Croton. No Sybarite, even ones that are betrayed by Tellys, no Sybarite likes, respects, admires, want to be in close proximity to any Crotonite. But they knew that Croton would accept them or has a high chance of accepting them. It was the closest city state to them anyway. And they had Pythagoras. Croton had Pythagoras, the master seer, the peacemaker, the son of Apollo. And the Crotonites, their governmental council, were really concerned. It's like, hey, do we want to stage war? Let's send these people back where they belong. This isn't our problem. And Pythagoras says, you send them back, they're all going to be slaughtered. So the Crotonites, this is where, where, this is where it begins, it's brewing up. The Crotonites sent 30 emissaries to Sybaris to try to abate the situation. Hey, the 500 people, we talked to them. We're going to keep them there. But do we really need battle? Do we need, really need war? Tully's murdered all of those emissaries. He murdered all 30 people. So here's how Milo's Goliath is bigger and better and more rewarding than David's Goliath. David was in his peak. Milo was burnt out by 512 BC. He had gone through a 28 year, now this is 30 years in 510 BC, 512 BC was a 28 year wrestling career. And now all of a sudden he is faced to command an army of inferior numbers, 100,000 seems like a lot, but Tully's had 300,000 conscripts mercenaries. Other than being paralyzed with fear, many of these soldiers watch Milo carry a bull multiple times and defeat the toughest men in the world in all the Panhellenic competitions. Here's a definition of a conscript. They are required. It's mandatory. It's obligatory for them to fight for their city-state. The definition of a mercenary is a fighter primarily concerned with making money at the expense of ethics. They get paid to fight. Their incentive is money. It's gold. Milo and all the Cretonians just had 
30 of their brothers and sisters murdered. This wasn't about money. This is about love, pride, righteousness. You kill my brothers and sisters, hey, I'll come out of my grave to fight that enemy. The resentment continued to fester for the ensuing 200 years, resulting in a great battle on 510 BC, where Sybaris mounted 300,000 conscripted warriors onto the battlefield against Croton's 100,000 athlete soldiers who were commanded by Milo, the champion wrestler. Can you imagine if you got 100,000 athlete soldiers that are on Milo's team, that have trained with Milo? Not only are they super athletic, they got the mental power. And they are also feeling the hurt of their brothers and sisters. They need revenge. They need retribution. This is honoring Zeus. So Milo's Goliath was faced with Teles' 300,000 mercenary army that were just fighting for gold. And Milo and his people were fighting for pride. The Crotonites plundered the city of Sybaris and laid it entirely to waste. So let's recap. David fought Goliath, if you want to call it a fight, when he slung a stone at Goliath when he was in his prime. Goliath was burdened with all this armor because he was a close combat combatant. David was an artillery man, at least in his fight against Goliath. I don't even think David fought in any other battle prior to that. He was killing birds and rabbits in mid-flight and mid-run to eat <laughs> with his sling. He was that accurate. Milo, after 30 years, 28 years to 512 BC at the 67th Olympiad Games, where he fought Timotheus, which was his toughest match ever, lasted hours and hours and hours. They say that the other didn't even lay a finger. Milo didn't touch Timotheus. Timotheus didn't touch Milo for hours and hours and hours until the sun went down. He was tired. It was post-peak for Milo. After 30 years of being a world champion, as Milo was, lifting a bull, being a strong man, doing all types of strong man demonstrations, he was 49 years old, literally at the Battle of Sybaris in 510 BC, which makes it even more heroic for Milo to say, I'm going to fight in this battle. We're going to win. He only had a winning mentality. His people, his brothers, his sisters were murdered. Milo and the Crote Knights had the incentive. David had the incentive to save his people from slavery for eternity. And Milo, all of a sudden, he's called to arms to defend his city-state of Croton and uphold the ideology that he and his people had for Croton and for the righteousness of their god, Zeus. If you are enjoying this content, please like, follow, share, and subscribe. And I'll continue to bring you more fascinating information on Milo of Croton and other great mythological and mortal figures from antiquity. I'm John Abdo, thanking you for watching. Stay strong and healthy, and perhaps one day, thousands of years from now, people then will be remembering your name as well.